Not rocket science, you just have to do the experiment, and that's all there is to it. But actually doing it is unbelievably hard work, miserably depressing most of the time, and, and very, very hard. Well, I've been for a long, long time fascinated by how you control entry into mitosis. I mean, you know, what, what makes a cell divide and why does it divide now and not five minutes later or half an hour earlier? I would like to talk to Tim Hunt because one of my projects was very similar to what he is doing, but I'm using a completely different approach than he does. I'm very excited to meet Professor Tim Hunt because he's the first person who discovered cycling. Cycling is a very important molecule in cell cycle. Cells grow and divide. And cycling, it's a molecule that governs the process. Not only dividing frog cells, but initially dividing starfish cells, <laughs> finally dividing human cells. This stuff it could even be found in yeast. It was totally a universal substance that makes cells enter M phase. I'm doing cancer biology now, and we know that cancer cells go through a very uh, fast cell cycle, or we can say their cell cycle regulation is defected. So I really want to ask him how, by understanding you know, how cell cycle is regulated, we can find out some way to cure cancer. I heard uh, you are working at Cancer Research Institute. This is true. I've only once seen a tumour actually. We were working, we were collaborating with some dentists and somebody brought up this disgusting tray with a bit of tongue that somebody had just cut out of an 80 something year old man. And one felt very sorry for the guy, you know, he just had his tongue cut out basically because it had an ugly, ugly tumour on the back of it. So you don't see any uh, potential uh, of the like a cycling antibody in, in combating cancer? No, 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 I don't think so because, um, you, you know, early on everyone said, oh gosh, you know, you guys have done such a great job defining the control of the cell <laughs> cycle, now you can cure cancer. But it's nonsense if you think about it because, yeah. yes, you understand a lot more about how cell division is controlled, but you know what happens if you block cell division. You die in about a week, right? Mm. The one thing that cancer cells do rather well is divide. Everybody knows that. So they, there's, there's, there's nothing really wrong with, yeah. uh, with, with the cell cycle machinery, unfortunately. What is wrong is that they grow when normal cells wouldn't grow. I've heard that Tim Hunt is not really a supporter of, of systems biology, but more a skeptic. He's saying that systems biology has uh, promised a lot, but not delivered as much as it has promised. He's a biochemist, so he focused on only one protein or two proteins only. But in systems biology, we look at the whole picture, you know, a network and it's a very complex system. I'm using a completely different approach than he does. He's looking at individual proteins in a more traditional reductionistic point of view, while I'm more in a holistic point of view trying to look at how does this protein interact with all the other proteins in the cell. I'm gonna try to con convince him that systems biology is important. So what stage are you um, at? I'm now in the last year of my PhD. Uh -huh. And what, what, what are you working on? Um, I'm working on, on um, systems biology, network biology. Ha! Ah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. I think it's kind of a, a nice complementary approach to the tra more traditional reductionistic uh, way of, of approaching biological problems. Yeah. I, I think it's good to have a dialogue. I yeah, mean, don't, exactly. Don't get me wrong. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so but I, I think both sides ought to spend more so, time talking to each yeah, other yeah, so, than they so. do. What do you think about like the systems biology approach? You you are like studying from like a single molecule and 
to, to well, I a... would say I was a systems biologist, actually. I mean, mitosis <laughs> is a sort of system, and it, it's a system. Uh-huh. as a start exactly. and a finish, and yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. stuff, yeah. stuff happens. So I, I consider that what I do to be real systems biology, and most mm-hmm. of what systems biologists say they're doing is not to be very useful in, in, in explaining the kind of questions I want to have answered in, in biology. And they tend to get very, up, very hung up on noise and things like that. And, mm-hmm. And it's interesting. I mean, you know, sometimes they do very, very ingenious experiments. I mean, they, you know, they hook up the beta galactosidase gene to a fluorescent reporter. But mm-hmm. actually, you know, they tend to just show that Jacob and Mono got it right in 1961. <laughs> when we performed the aurora kinase substrate prediction uh, experiment, the biologists were ha- very happy that we could supply them with a with limited some things list. things to go and look at. Exactly. Yeah. To have something like 50,000 human proteins. Mm-hmm. You don't want to have to look at every single one or test every single one of them, whether they might be a substrate or not, right? And so right. that we could kind of... Uh, narrow down. S- narrow down the, the, the list, list to a, a manageable yeah. number. I mean, 19... Yeah, I'm a little bit dubious about systems biology. These sort of static pictures of what interacts with what, I don't find very illuminating. You can't even tell whether they're true or not, actually. It's one of the serious, serious issues. And, you know, you make these lists of things, and it's just, and which are painfully acquired over, over time. And um, it's very hard to make sense of what it all, what it all means, I must say. Yeah. You know, you just get these bloody non incomprehensible <laughs> systems biology <laughs> lists. Exactly. Of which exactly. Uh, Sidney Brenner is very scathing, you know. <laughs> Low input, high throughput, no, no output. output. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard that. Yeah. Exactly. What's, what's his main skepticism was, was that he was saying, okay, you, you have all this data, but you don't know what, is, what are the functional consequences of, of what you see. And I think that's, that's the, the, the great thing about combining the reductionists with a systems biology approach so that you can first, you, you offer some, some uh, lists of, of genes or protein interactions to test and then uh, the other people can go into the lab and test them individually and, and try to, to find out what are the, the functional consequences for the cell. And that is kind of important to combine those two worlds. When you know more about the basics of the system, so you know not only all the components, but also how they interact with each other, and then you can try to, to build yeah, some, but some then models sort of how to do you abstract explain the, the salient details from that. I'm, I'm really not, yeah, that, not that's, sure. That's where I think that, that you have to, to try to look for emergent properties. You know, yeah, like exactly. Saying, like, okay, when, when we take, even if we have to take some simplifying assumptions in order that we can build up a model to describe the system, how it works. So it is a formidably complicated problem and I think actually maybe a lot of people are pretty naive about it mm. at, at yeah, the moment. I think that in order to understand those complex systems we really have to go into the dynamics. Well it has both to be the physiology, right? Yeah, I mean you've got to want, you want to watch things happening over time. I mean mm-hmm. I think that's, that's what I learned very early on, you know, everything we measured was always had the, time was always a dimension in the thing and and the trouble with a lot of what is called systems biology is a very static picture yeah very yeah. static indeed you know? yeah. systems biology no i mean people are doing like dynamics like studies analysis too right yeah but not much of this sort of physiological flux analysis i mean oh. things really changing over time mm. or the rates of change they tend to sort of look more on statistical things yeah like noise i mean there, there are some flux based analysis on, on metabolic systems mm. but there they are some in some form they are they're farther than in the field of, of protein interactions mm-hmm. whereas i think that systems biology is only at the beginning as far as i'm concerned everything comes from an observation yeah mm-hmm. yeah uh, in, in 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 the first place a reproducible observation and then you just sort of follow it wherever it goes and you ask questions about it. That's just the kind of scientist I am. Mm-hmm. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. I mean, different people are different, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and some people... I think my advice to a sort of, uh, you know, practicing systems biologist is, is to spend plenty of time talking to real biologists. How can you sort of draw it out on a system or a sort of a, a, a logical diagram even when you don't even know what the players are in the process? I mean, it just seems premature to me. So you've got to sort of you know, truffle around and turn over stones and sort of notice that sort of things don't quite make sense. And sometimes that's more of a gut reaction than, a, than something you know. And I've, I've always had this sort of feeling that this, there are some very old observations whose explanation we don't understand. You could not explain in rational terms. 
I think myself as a biologist now, a biologist who try to combine engineering and uh, math and physics. I see there's a big gap between biological science and physical science, and I really want to bridge the gap between the two uh, in the future, in my future career. So I mean, like, you think like people from physics uh, background or engineering background? I think they be should able be able to... I mean, I'd be interested to talk to an engineer who knew about plant design, you know. How uh -huh. wide does a particular pipe have to be, to, mm. given that it's got to conduct yeah. so much water or so much I study chemical engineering. Yeah. So chemical I, engineering is exactly a chemical yes, engineering yes. problem. And, and those are the people, actually, funnily enough, who don't, we don't seem to talk to and I think those guys know what they're doing very very well indeed it's mm -hmm. a question of though how you apply those principles to things that are much much harder to measure yeah. in in living cells yeah. so what about yeah. people from like a multiple fields like I, I'm double majoring in biology and chemical engineering well that's great and you, maybe you're the next <laughs> generation <laughs> Sophia turns out is doing a sort of double major in biology and chemical engineering and I, I kind of feel that uh, chemical engineering is very much like the cell. Um, so she should, uh, you know, if she can sort of make those connections, I think that could be a very powerful combination, actually. Should stand her in good stead. If she can, you know, be as quantitative as you have to be for an engineer, a chemical engineer, and apply that to the biological situation, that would be great, really great. When I started out my PhD, I had no idea what to do, absolutely none. And uh, fortunately, my first project didn't work, which was jolly lucky, because I think I wouldn't be sitting here now if it had. <laughs> and then I had a sort of another one, and that didn't go very far. And it wasn't, you know, it took me about three attempts to find something that really was actually an important yeah. Yeah. question, which nobody else was. And then it sort of seemed so obvious that I got terribly worried that surely there must be somebody else in the world who was doing this, and we were about to be scooped. You know, you have to focus, but you also have to be distractible. I mean, if something, if something interesting sort of crawls yeah. across your path, yeah. Uh, it's perfectly okay to, to go after it. I always tell people, you know, you need to keep your feet on the ground yeah, yeah. and your eyes on the horizon <laughs> <laughs> and your nose to the grindstone, of course, you know. I mean, <laughs> like Oliver Smithies and all his Saturday morning experiments. I'm a great believer, incidentally, in Saturday morning experiments. Those are the sort of simple ones where you just try stuff out and see if it 